thinking, okay, well, wouldn't it be cool if I did the same thing for Jamers and I created kind of this converter so that Jamers can use his preferred pad at the event? Wouldn't that be cool? And he could play the cabinets on this preferred pad. So after two days and hours and hours of tinkering this and rigging, so I rigged up a, a, sa a Saimitsu <laughs> pin thing, which I had to hand wire and hand wrap the wires. And then I rigged up this crazy external battery supply thing with, with when I literally chewed the wires open. But by God, it actually Everything is hand wrapped. So that means if something it was just slightly ajar. If something bumped the cabinet the wrong way or Jamers yanked on the cord too hard or something, though I did try to settle everything in place as much possible. If anything that happened, the converter could just lose one contact point. And what does that mean? That means like he's going right the entire time or he's going up left the entire time. Like if one contact point fails, the entire setup fails. And usually it ends up, the glitch ends up being like, he just flies left constantly and he can't change where he's going or anything. If this converter fails mid run, it's going to be the most embarrassing thing ever, 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 ever. I think James had way more confidence in this setup than, uh, uh, than I did in terms of it failing on him or not. He's like on stage, there's, I don't know how many, 40 or so people watching him live, plus the people on stream, plus I'm recording this for the documentary, so it'll be recorded forever. He got the two all with the converter. And I run over there. I'm like popping up harder than him. So I'm like, oh, thank God the converter didn't fail. Yes. I was shitting my pants the entire run. Praying the converter didn't die on me. <laughs> I was like, gamers will shoot me if that converter dies. Emergency, uh, emergency back to the level. <laughs> it's gone, thanks. <laughs> Being a fan of shmups makes no sense. Shmups, shoot'em ups, STG, whatever you want to call them, are a genre without commercial prospect, without widespread appeal, and are deeply rooted in the dying arcade business model. The legends of the genre like Cave, Rising, Taito, Toplan, Irem, Saikyo, Treasure, and even Konami have either closed their doors or barely produced new titles. And the few projects that do come out are either ports of existing games or small-scale throwbacks. The glory days of so-called quarter munchers are over. They have no commercial future. At this point, if you want to launch a shmup to a mainstream audience, even with strong name recognition, you'll probably have to crowdfund the project and start monetizing with waves of DLC. And even if you try to resurrect an established IP, the original creators, the masterminds behind the iconic game design, are long gone anyway. As a player, you can expect to spend thousands of hours being hammered by unrelenting difficulty with no external benefit. You're not going to be sponsored like a fighting game player, you're not going to create a brand like a speedrunning celebrity, and you will not gain millions of views like a challenge channel. 
the best you can hope for is to be a living legend in a niche community of a couple of hundred players. Your peers will marvel at your talent, but be unable to express its depths to the wider gaming world who frankly do not give a damn. And then, if you are really crazy, you can organize a shmup event. You can spend God knows how much money storing expensive arcade boards and renting out premium floor space with absolutely no prospect of making any return on the expenses. And what has it been like uh, running an arcade in Europe? Because you run an arcade or you used to run an arcade. What has uh, that been like? Yes, I used it to, to own it, but uh, not, uh, the, uh, let's say, to professional level. It was uh, more like a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. uh, entertainment and of course I lost money with it because if not my wife <laughs> will kill me and will make it close very soon. You can open up a shoot 'em up centric arcade in 2024 just like you can invest in a payphone company. This is Shmups, gaming's purest art form, a concentration of challenges so distilled that broader commercial projects can only reference its aesthetics. Many games want to look like a shmup, but very few are bold enough to play like one. In truth, there is no trendy endpoint for STG, there is no great career or millions of cheering fans, there is only passion without reason. They say the videos, uh, people uh, having fun, and uh, they are telling, oh, I hope to can go ne the next time. And maybe that thing is what is pushing me to make every year uh, the event because it's always better, bigger, <laughs> and you, you know more people. Yes. It's like, it's like an enrichment. Hi, welcome to my documentary on the greatest video game genre. A genre that refuses to die despite every metric signifying that it should. Shmups exist against better judgment. They are mortal because an economy based on insanity cannot crash. It sounds grim, but there is something beautifully tragic about these games and the artistic impulse that compels people to play them. There is no single archetype of the shmup player. The genre has a surprisingly varied audience. From old Japanese businessmen, to British rock stars, to hicks in Idaho. Most regions of the world, even those without an arcade history, still somehow manage to find these games and connect with them. I think that the only shmup it was writing, mm -hmm. and probably out of fighters, but I, I mean, I. I can barely think about it, but yeah, it was real small. Language or culture are not a barrier. Believe me, I can't read a word of Japanese, and yet I import these games with full confidence. Unlike culture-centric media like anime and role-playing games, shmups speak a universal language. There is no need for translation. The mechanics are beautifully clear. Interested in my body, aren't you? Not interested. Oh, you're into that. I like girls. In fact, I do not believe it is possible for there to be one overarching shmup community because of the genre's cross-demographic appeal. And even within what some may describe as a limited spectrum of design, you can see wildly divergent preferences. I like a lot of like milestone games, alpha system. Uh, I'm also getting into success games lately, but like very good developers, and, and these devs were all, also had games on the Wii, so like My Stone Shooting Collection, mm -hmm. Castle Shigami 3, uh, these kind of games, so I played them a bit and uh, really got to enjoy them. There is no standard way people discover STG either. I've heard hundreds of stories of people finding their way to the genre, and it's usually a combination of circumstances rather than a single event. Well, I think I get into shooting ups when I was a child, but more in a casual basis, so more in a hardcore style, thinking about one CCs and all that. Only a few years ago, watching some streamers, getting relaxed, because it's, for me it's a hard thing when you are playing, but when you are watching other guys, it's, it's kind of relaxing. 
So yes. a few years ago I got into shooting us in a more hardcore base. Uh, and the way I got into Smups was I was just kind of bored of the conventional game and walking simulators and so on. And by chance I bought a Sega Saturn. Um, because there aren't really many games out for the Sega Saturn in the UK. Quite quickly I had the question of well, what games can I buy for it and it was fighting games and Smups. Right. So that's how I started. So King of Fighters and then like layer section and games like that. Uh, people talk about Ikaruga, and when I saw Ikaruga, I thought, okay, shmups, uh, there is a very old genre or something like that, but when I saw Ikaruga, I, I was surprised because I, I thought, oh, oh, but people still playing these uh, games with uh, ships and shooting. In that era, I played Ikaruga, Castle of Shikigami, Under the Feet, and games like that. Then, when I got a 360, I import games like Don Pachi Resurrection, um, Muchi Muchi Pork, uh, Pink Sweets, Escatos, Bullet Souls. The games slowly creep up on you, and before you know it, they subtly shift the standards by which you judge video games. After spending months injecting uncut gameplay directly into the bloodstream, sitting through hours of walking sections and tutorialized levels just doesn't feel right. Danmaku are constructed like poetry. Video game haiku, dense, lyrical, and infinitely repeatable. They don't feel the need to teach you the basics over and over like modern games. And the frustrating part is that general audiences have no idea what they are missing and it is impossible to show them until they are willing to struggle. Well, when you first started playing them, what was your first impression? Probably the difficulty. Uh, yeah, absolutely the difficulty I'd say as well. So. Um, like I very much transitioned from very much mainstream game and JRPGs quite a lot as well, just the usual AAA stuff as well. And it is surprising and just quite humbling just how difficult they are when you start, but I think it's just important if you set your own goals in the games and actually just enjoy the process and the gameplay. Don't really sweat it being difficult and before you know it you'll end up just, you know, like a, just achieving like one CC and that sort of thing as well. So. Is it elitist? Maybe, but elevated art cannot always be both deep and accessible. Modern game design is based on being fair and never frustrating the player, but for an activity to be meaningful, it needs to push the player out of his comfort zone. There's no doubt that the road to shmups is a treacherous one. It's a journey you must embark on alone without any external motivation offered. You will have every reason to quit and return home, and many do. It is common to try these games for a few months and then give up in frustration. The difficulty curve is designed to be overwhelming. It's not very difficult because I remember even the first, like the first uh, boss in the easiest difficulty of Toho 6, some of the patterns I was like, I was having trouble with them, like it was very challenging. But nowadays I look at them and like, oh, they're not that relatively basic, but it's just that as a new player, like there's so many things you don't know, like, oh, uh, how to stream the bullets, or, like, how to deal with aimed bullets, and oh, curvy bullets, how can I like anticipate the trajectories and all these kind of things. Of course I didn't know, so it was hard, but it was fun. And no other game genre is bold enough to do this to its potential player base. Large game companies literally cannot afford to take this risk, especially because they are publicly traded, and even small-scale indie games with tiny player bases tend to shy away from this style of design. But for those who stick with it, they are able to connect with a philosophy of game design that is not replicated anywhere else. A shmup player learns to welcome punishment. The genre teaches you to value challenge. These days there's nothing more disappointing than buying a game with interesting mechanics and absolutely no bite to enforce them. Not a problem in shmups, especially among the greats of the genre. First I had read quite a lot about shmups before actually getting to play it. But uh, it was the thrill of excitement of uh, achieving even the most simple feel like, like beating stage one, beating stage two, and uh, wanting to constantly like progress and uh, be driven by the game. I, it's hard to say. A lot of frustration also, but also a lot of uh, pleasure from understanding the mechanics and then executing mechanics. Because uh, I think this is maybe something man not many new players realize is the strategic aspect into it, which is quite uh, quite interesting. Today, there's a lot of talk about meaning in game design, how games are meaningful when they serve up warmed-over narratives to an infinitely patient audience. That's 
cool and everything, but for me, I don't find meaning in cutscenes or gently prompted button presses. I find it while facing a sadistic final boss that has crushed my hopes dozens of times before. This documentary probably sounds like the ravings of a madman, and maybe it is, but if you keep an open mind, we can explore the unique appeal of a truly uncompromising genre. Let's talk about what initially set the genre of shoot'em ups apart from the rest of the video game playing world. The first thing that has to be understood about shmups is that the design is a byproduct of the arcade business model. No arcade, no shmup, at least historically. We'll discuss what a post arcade world looks like later, and we can talk about what shmups made outside of the arcade model, your shmups as they are known, tend to look like. But in terms of their conception, gestation, and birth, the legacy of these games descends from the arcade. The defining trait of the arcade business model is the concept of coin turnover. How much money can a cabinet make in the course of an hour? Because in the context of the arcade, time costs money, literally. Arcades have hours of operation. During these hours, they need to pay for rent, staff, electricity, and probably dozens of other costs. So the value of a cabinet is how quickly it can hook the player and get him pressing buttons. Shmups excel in this property of coin turnover because of the density of their gameplay. They're designed to always push the player forward, even against his will. There is no long intermissions or spaces to catch your breath, as we see in general game design. When you play Donanpachi, your breaks only last long enough to scratch your nose and check the coins in your pocket. Shmups. Like, there aren't really like any other like games or genre that I quite like it. Like, I noticed like after I played like a lot of shmups, then I went back to like other games that uh, I got bored like really quickly. <laughs> like in other games, I just like there's like so much downtime where like nothing is happening and nothing or something is like really easy, mm -hmm. and like I get bored really quickly, <laughs> and I just I just so yeah, let's go back to shmups all the time. <laughs> this is just the most fun. So the key idea when composing an arcade game is to hit that perfect difficulty curve of engaging the player right away, but never allowing him to be comfortable enough to take his time for granted. Every moment needs to be meaningful, otherwise the arcade owner is just paying power bills. Coin revenue is a model that allows moment to moment gameplay to matter monetarily. In the arcade, because of the credit system, wasted time on the cabinet is wasted money. This results in a style of game design which needs to keep the player struggling as much as possible without completely breaking him. It's the golden difficulty curve. It's the only system of game design where balance and replayability is more important than volume of content. Actually, I started playing one hour a day, two hours a day. So I got my key on PCB normal. I was like, I want to step up on the game. So I went PCB hard. PCB Lunatic. This is where I made the jump, basically, uh, on Toho 7. Uh, it took me two months from my normal clear to my Lunatic clear, but uh, basically I played it a little bit every day. I was doing a stage select, so only practicing stage separately. And I had some very consistent strat, and when I tried my run on hard difficulty, I basically cleared it the same day. Like the first day of run, uh, I got my clear. I, I remember at the end of December, I got uh, my Toho 12 clear, and uh, everybody was saying that it was the hardest if you don't count Toho 3. And uh, definitely I felt like that was the wall. Like I uh, really grinding the game for one month and uh, yeah, I was playing. This is when I started playing a lot more. Like it was during the holidays, uh, the Christmas holiday, I was playing four hours, five hours a day. <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah, this is pretty much my first uh, real grind. And uh, I got my clear like uh, just before the new year. Like uh, I think it was uh, 30 or 31 of December. And uh, very happy with that. And uh, after that, I felt like uh, I would get all the other clear very fast, and I did get all the other clear very fast. Like basically, two months after, I got all the other clear. In the home video game market, the incentives are reversed. Because console games are sold all at once as an entire package, they can afford to pad out their runtime with longer, less intense difficulty. Volume and unique content becomes the primary economic metric rather than self-contained replayability. 
just look at what happened to the original Super Mario Bros. 2 in the console market. You know, the one that never made it out of Japan and had to be reskinned in America? If this sounds far-fetched, just count how many times game reviewers evaluate a game based on content versus how many times they evaluate a game based on balance. At this point, there's even an entire website, howlongtobeat.com, that attempts to objectively record how much content console video games have. There is no howbalancedandreplayable.com, I know I checked. A concrete example of this is Streets of Rage 4. Rage 4 is a fun, well-made beat-em-up, especially given today's trends, but the game is simply too long. Two hours of somewhat repeated content, especially the museum stage, would waste both the players and developers' time in an arcade environment. But in the context of the home market, where more is always better, the uneven runtime is now a strength, and this is reflected in reviews of the game. Ironically, even a two-hour campaign mode is still not enough for IGN, who described the runtime as short. Then again, when IGN reviewed Ikaruga, they felt the game's biggest weakness was that it should have been twice as long. This is why mainstream reviews of arcade genres are absurd. They don't understand an arcade game's value proposition to begin with. Doubling Ikaruga's runtime would be insane, especially with such a precise chaining system. So arcade games are built within the coin revenue model, and the fact that each credit rewards replayability is why shmups are the most developed when it comes to density and difficulty curves. However, in recent years, a similar model has emerged in the mobile gaming market. The infamous free-to-play model. This is where you download a game for free, and instead of buying it outright, you pay per play. Just like an arcade, right? I bring up this free-to-play model because a lot of people have mentioned over the years that this is the successor to the arcade business model. In fact, there are examples of arcade games being directly adopted into the free-to-play format, like Gunbird 2. On the surface, this idea makes sense because they both share the same element of paying per credit, but do not make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison here, because while the structure of the free-to-play model and arcade model have some similarities, their context and outcome are extremely different. So different that they are basically opposites. They do not share the same design philosophy at all. Let's start with arcade games. Arcade games are built on the idea of being intrinsically rewarding. And what I mean by intrinsic is that they have to be rewarding within their own system. They have a lot of tools at their disposal like graphics, music, scoring, and of course game design. But outside of what is on the PCB, these games cannot reach into your wallet. You have to come to them. You have to physically put your quarter into the machine. And um, when I got playing on the arcade, that that changed everything because you want to be in that league. It is it is a total different league. When you're playing like home and you have all this, like normally you give you three credits and all that, and you push like how, how hard the game should be and all that, but the arcade is what it is. It's like you put one credit, that's it. So I don't know, that changed my mind and uh, put me on a position where, all right, I want to play this shit like seriously. So I start buying um, PCBs and all that crap. You know that. I mean, I sent you a list of PCBs, I guess, when I was, uh, we were doing this map slam and uh, yeah, <laughs> back then, yeah. An arcade game must seduce the player. Oh, and the burden of the arcade yeah. is to literally get you to leave your comfortable home, travel who knows how far, and spend your money in a public location. There are gaming's equivalent of the movie theater, and for a brief while, they held that same prestige. An arcade game, like a theatrical film, has to be a premium product. It has to be the best of the best. The beauty of the graphics, because for quite some time, like uh, you looked at Shmup, you looked at like the most beautiful games, like for example, Darius Game for really impressive graphics for for that time, and uh, even now, even uh, like in the 90s with the nice 2D like rising, like you see like by games like that, like aesthetically, it's very uh, very pleasing. This is why the Neo Geo was famous for bringing the arcade to your home, unlike the Super Nintendo because it was the actual premium arcade hardware. In the late 90s, that would have been the equivalent of buying a film projector with film reels. Exactly the same. You can start a game in the arcade and finish it at home. Astounding, right? Here, have a look. 
Here I am, peoples, just hanging out at the factory where they make these Neo Geo multi-video systems. Now, what these things are is that you can play four different games on this machine. Mobile games, then, are not premium content, not in the slightest, nor are they made with this goal or intention, because in today's marketplace, the space for premium products is actually the home console market, or better or worse. Home consoles have replaced arcade games, not mobile games. Mobile games don't seduce their players, they target them. You, as a gamer, don't wake up in the morning planning out your day to play a mobile game, hopefully. If you do, please seek help. Instead, you seek out mobile games when you are mentally vulnerable. You are stuck in a work meeting. You are bored on a bus. You are trapped in a terrible social gathering. This is the context mobile games are designed for. They're made to be played against your better judgment. They attack their players instead of enticing them. They employ psychological manipulation rather than artistic merit, which is effective for profits. Gamification is the term. Basically, get the player to play for some other reason than the gameplay itself. The gameplay is merely a tool for engagement rather than the overall goal. And while the mobile game has the player engaged, it can push him to spend money on microtransactions. Digital money, by the way. The loss of the physical coin is also significant because mobile games don't want you to realize how much money you're spending. Is there any plans to make this playable on PC or is this strictly mobile forever? Uh, are there any, uh, yeah, uh, this, this, the current plan is to be on mobile, both uh, Android and iOS. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do uh, PC. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones, phone, right? You play your tablet, too. So even though in the mobile market you are paying per credit, like an arcade game, there is no coin turnover aspect to their design. Mobile games are more than happy to have bloated content. They just need to keep you engaged by any means necessary. Look at gotcha games. Carefully balanced repeatable gameplay mechanics is not the goal. They may be the premium market for sexy waifus and gambling mechanics, but they are not a premium market for game design. This concept is not just limited to mobile games either. In recent years, I've also noticed that indie developers are turning to some of these principles as well, even in the absence of microtransactions. Granted, this is less nasty than the free-to-play model, but I think it's a method of leveraging mediocre gameplay with gamification rather than being a virtue within game design itself. And maybe this is just the ugly reality of making indie games in 2024, but I think developers should be more cautious towards this style of design. I as a player find it really annoying when I can see that the game I'm playing has been gamified. Arcade shmups then escape gamification. They do not have overarching progression systems. They do not have unlocks outside of crazy hidden cheat codes. They do not have randomly generated content and they do not aim for passive low grade consumption. Shmups want your full attention and will crush you beneath their fists if you don't comply. Never forget the duty of an American. I pay taxes, work, and I always vote. A signature feature of the shoot 'em up genre is difficulty. These games are hard, no one would argue against that. In fact, they are so difficult, they get removed from difficult game discussions altogether. The Guardian did an article of the most difficult games of all time, and they did include Battle Garega and Mushihime-sama in that list. But if they were being realistic, the entire roster would pretty much be shmups, especially with something insane like Same 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 prowling out there. Essentially, these lists end up dropping shmups from the conversation, just like when the New York Times stopped putting Harry Potter on their bestseller reports. And after all, you can't understand exactly how difficult a shmup is if you can't play one in the first place. Ironically, if shmups were easier, their difficulty would be more widely discussed, 
This is why Dark Souls is the go-to example in the journalist lexicon. Dark Souls is hard, yes, but it is relatably difficult. Whereas Uraloop and Ketsui is so outside the grasp of the greater audience that they don't have anything to compare it to. And shmup difficulty is widely misunderstood. Most reviews chalk up the difficulty of the genre to the supposed simplicity of its design. The idea is that since shmups are simple games, then the only meaningful direction for them is to become arbitrarily difficult. The difficulty is an excuse for replay value, a dirty, filthy excuse at that. This is where we get the teeth grinding term quarter muncher from. A quarter muncher is a slot machine at a casino, not an arcade game, but to this day I see this comparison made all the time. It is a fundamental misunderstanding of game design on multiple levels. First of all, shmups are not a simple genre. The term simple is double-edged, where sometimes it can be neutral, but it's often demeaning. I've seen shmup players try to roll with this and say, shmups are simple in the same way that chess is simple and that their simplicity is part of their appeal, but I disagree. A simple game is tic-tac-toe, not chess, where tic-tac-toe is fun and breezy, but ultimately disposable. Shmups are not disposable. Instead, to return to the chess comparison, shmups are elegant games where the rule set is quick to learn, but the overall possibilities are vast. This is where discussion of these games always gets tripped up, because depth is not how many rules a game has, it's how much meaningful interaction these rules have with each other. On the surface, all you are doing in a shmup is navigating a hitbox away from other hitboxes in a three-dimensional space these three dimensions being horizontal, vertical, and the occasional z-axis of grounded enemies. Shmups actually have a fourth dimension, but we'll talk about that in an upcoming chapter. And as you're navigating your hitbox around the play area, you're also trying to eliminate enemies while not taking damage. Does this premise sound familiar? It should, because it is the premise of every game with combat. There is no special difference in rule set between shmups and other action games in their overall concept. The simple part about shmups that is misunderstood is how fundamental their approach to combat is. Unlike other action game genres, shmups do not have many restrictions. For example, with movement, the player can freely move around the screen. There is no restricting force that constantly pulls the player downward. There is no gravity, for lack of a better term. Think about this in comparison to a game like Mega Man. Mega Man has some overlap in how its combat works, where the player shoots projectiles and avoids enemy hitboxes, but the massive difference is how many restrictions are placed on his movement. Mega Man can only run horizontally and then lift temporarily when he jumps. He also cannot remain in a vertical position. He has to return to the horizontal plane, and then he cannot sink downward into the ground. There's no such thing as a reverse jump downward, which would be pretty cool. So Mega Man's overall movement potential is aggressively restricted when compared to what a shmup can do. Funnily enough, as the series advances, the new games create exceptions to their own restrictions. This is where the supposed complexity comes from. Take Mega Man X. In Mega Man X, the character can now wall jump and ground boost. This allows him more sophisticated spacing in the air at the cost of additional inputs. On the surface then, just looking at the button presses, Mega Man may appear deeper because this movement tech does not exist in a shmup. I've heard speedrunners say this all the time, they like games with movement tech. But let's not forget that Mega Man is still more restricted in the first place because of gravity. Here's an easy way to visualize movement depth. Imagine if you placed Mega Man into a shmup, and then you placed Rosa from Death Smiles into Mega Man. Rosa would easily obliterate all of Mega Man's spacing challenges because she can fly. And Mega Man would die within moments in Death Smiles because he's restricted to this horizontal movement. So even though Mega Man's movement seems more complicated, it is not deeper than a shmup. Depth comes from the possibility of how the game mechanics interact with the premise of spacing. It's just that shmups have more direct access to their movement than other genres. 
They are extremely fundamental in how they play the spacing game. In fact, one of the hallmarks of a quality shmup is how efficient and reliable its controls are. This is why Cave's invention of the focused versus unfocused movement is so popular. Because the slow focus movement is not just a restriction placed to balance the laser, it is also a helpful asset when the player wants very precise spacing through dense bullet patterns. So yes, shmup mechanics are elegant and precise, but that doesn't make them simple, that makes them fundamental. No, this isn't happening! There's no reason for me to go on! What? What am I fighting for? As I said before, layering rule upon rule does not create depth. What creates depth is how meaningfully a game pushes its core premise. And part of pushing that core premise is difficulty. To make an analogy, if the rule set and mechanics of a game form an engine, then it is difficulty that acts as fuel for that engine. Without difficulty, mechanics do not have energy. And as much as I like the game, I'm going to pick on Mega Man X one last time. A while back, I completed a no death clear of Mega Man X using Buster only. I did this because X has this mechanic of boss weakness to shot types. So if you are using the right gun on the right boss, you can essentially skip the entire fight without combat. This boss to shot type weakness adds more complexity to the game on paper, but removes depth in practice. Because by using the shot type weakness, Mega Man is able to erase the fundamental combat of the boss fights. Who needs to move in space when you can simply stun lock the boss into oblivion? Also, X has no counter incentive to use the shot type. So in the eyes of the game, there is never a reason not to turn Stark Mandro into a frozen cube. Besides influencing the order in which the stages are played, this weakness mechanic has no trade-offs. If Capcom were interested in introducing more depth into Mega Man X, they would create a counter incentive to the shot type system and encourage Buster only. This incentive could be in the form of scoring, but we'll talk more about that later. If you are a Mega Man X fan then, what you are left with is imposing a self challenge of Buster only, which isn't as good as the game recognizing the playstyle. But once you've mastered it, which isn't very difficult, what's left? Nothing really. The game has reached its limit. This is why players turn to something like speedrunning for metagame depth. In Bullet Hell, the difficulty is interlocked with the design of the game at its core. The two are one and the same. Because shmups have a more direct relationship with their mechanics, without layers of restriction, this means that as the game becomes more deep, the difficulty will increase. Uh, I tried normal. I couldn't clear at the first time, had some troubles. Uh, I remember getting... So I started with Toho Hate, so Imperishable Night, and uh, I got spanked by Stage 4, basically, like most people. I tried Easy Mode a little bit, just to see what the end game was. So then go back, went back, uh, so I got the clear very easily on Easy Mode, it's really easy. Went back to Normal Mode and uh, tried it. Uh, a little bit harder every time, just uh, kept doing runs and like in, within two or three weeks I got my first clear, I guess. Like I, for me easy mode didn't really count, so yeah. For me easy mode didn't really count, so yeah. Returning to the engine analogy, if you want your combat to fire on all cylinders, it's going to require a lot of fuel. So instead of being arbitrary, the difficulty is naturally occurring. And what makes shmups unique is that they are able to support large amounts of challenge where the mechanics of other genres tend to break down under pressure. If there's one lesson we learn from this chapter, it's that difficulty purifies design. And what I mean is that if you have a game with a soup full of mechanics, the force that clarifies which mechanics are effective is difficulty. Shmups excel in this concept because they are designed and tested under high degrees of stress. In a lower intensity game, especially one without scoring incentive, the view of what mechanics are effective becomes muddy. A classic example is a fighting game player's beliefs on balance before entering tournaments. They are wildly inaccurate. Day 1 tier lists are infamous for a reason. When you are fighting at lower difficulty against an ignorant opponent, 
the weaknesses of the character are not exploited. Then you take that character onto Fightcade against skilled players and after some painful beatdowns, the tears become more obvious. I learned this the hard way while trying to play Kami in Street Fighter 2. Why this matters is because it connects back to the concept of depth requiring meaningful interactions. It is the pressure of difficulty that exposes the weaknesses of a game's design. Take the melee combat of FF16 for example. At first, melee seems like a viable option when you're playing against low HP opponents at the beginning of the game. I thought so. But as the difficulty of the game increases across the campaign and enemy HP starts to get higher, it becomes clear how weak the melee combat actually is. The meta clearly is more about using special attacks and summons. This is why, if you want to know what a game's fundamental combat really looks like, you should watch high difficulty clears, rather than meaningless combo videos where the player just shows off a bunch of filler moves against a helpless opponent. This is another reason, I think, why modern games are so difficulty adverse. Not only do they want to avoid alienating beginner players, but they also don't want to spend the dev time trying to balance all the mechanics to be meaningful. It's like building a house out of sticks. As long as there's no wind, the structure should hold up, right? And let's not forget that in addition to the game's internal difficulty, the design must also withstand the assault of player skill, where skilled players will exploit weaknesses in the game's mechanics on their end. This is an issue that rises up in Euro shmups. Many of them are not battle-tested by super players and so are easily broken into helpless bits of code shortly after release. The hallmark of great game design are games that can withstand both their own internal difficulty as well as the skill of the god-tier players who aim to destroy them. Shmups among single-player genres withstand this test very consistently. Because the difficulty ceiling of most genres is so low, Skilled players end up resorting to self-imposed challenges to keep things interesting. And it is usually these challenges that are more informative about the game's design than the intended difficulty, because the added challenge creates clarity for how the game is balanced. This is down to fundamentals at this point. Yes, it is. Ledge grabbing. He's got it. I've been up the parlor. Gets steamed. But so does Zost. Zost gets hit as well. And I am... Speaking of challenge runs, let's discuss speedrunning, the most popular form of challenge run. Notoriously, shmups are one of the few genres that escape the meta of speedrunning. The reason for this, obviously, is because shmups auto-scroll. Every speedrunner hates auto-scrolling, and gamers generally share their distaste for it. I can understand this sentiment because, if done incorrectly, auto-scrolling is hell on earth. There is no worse feeling than running to the edge of the screen and just waiting for something to happen. A word of advice for devs. If your players are moving to the edge of the screen and waiting, your level design sucks. And this is where I think the concept gets unfairly disregarded. Because the vast majority of auto-scrolling sections in most games do not work. They don't integrate the core design of what the game does well and are usually a bare-bones diversion. The end result being that they add nothing and waste time. But here's a perspective that speedrunners don't often consider. What are the virtues of an auto-scroll? Why does this concept exist in the first place? What can an auto-scroll do that a manual scroll simply cannot? Let's consider an example from speedrunning. Super Mario Bros. is a beloved speedrunning game, and rightly so. What's fun about SMB is that you pretty much hold forward constantly and there's barely any downtime. But if you watch this game closely, you'll notice something interesting. Because of the way the camera system has to function in a manual scroll, where you always need to see in front of you, this creates a barrier in the center of the screen that Mario simply cannot pass until the end of the stage. In fact, Without knowing what is ahead of you, you still subconsciously recognize the end of the level when Mario crosses this invisible line. In the world of platforming, where your main concern is watching for pits ahead of you and timing your jumps over them, this camera system is fantastic. It gives you a sense of speed while also allowing you to anticipate the upcoming obstacles. You are still running at the edge of the screen, just like you do in an auto-scroll, but it doesn't seem that way because the screen moves along with you. 
In a platformer, the majority of obstacles are static and conquered by moving over them. So this ability to see a pit ahead of you and stop the camera doesn't alter the level design too much. In Mario Bros, a tricky jump will be tricky, whether you run at it full speed at the start or stop, turn around, and then run at it after a break. In both cases, you still need to get that jump timing and the interaction with the pit is the same. You either make it across or you don't. There is no variation in outcome. So in the case of a platformer, where you are focusing on jumping over mostly static hazards, the manually scrolling camera is a perfect fit, especially since you are locked to a horizontal plane of movement and your vertical jumps are high commitment. Screen real estate in a jumping game matters less than being able to look ahead of what your character is doing. But what happens when you introduce combat into the equation? What happens when you go from jumping over pits to engaging with enemies? Well, as many Ninja Gaiden players have experienced, there is an awkward relationship between the movement of the camera and the behavior of the enemies. Because if your camera is locked to your movement, you can't back away from enemies without despawning them, since their existence is tied to being on screen. This leads to the notorious Ninja Gaiden syndrome, where you can actually lock yourself out of certain screen positions if you miss the initial jump. Again, this is because your screen position and camera view are tied together. In an auto-scroller, this doesn't happen because you move independently from the camera. And as obnoxious as Ninja Gaiden respawns are, they are a response to a pretty complicated question. Because if the manual scrolling game decides to not respawn enemies out of frame, this leads to a very broken technique on the player's behalf that I like to call stepping. What stepping is, is a camera exploit technique that I use all the time, especially in Metal Slug, where instead of moving forward at a normal pace as intended, you inch forward gradually to spawn enemies in isolation. What this allows the player to do is take what was intended to be group encounters and break them into singular enemy spawns, which are easier to eliminate. In an auto scroll, of course, this technique is impossible because the enemy spawn rate is fixed. Funny enough, the developers of Metal Slug recognize this technique and in certain sections create locked in screens that do not allow the player to proceed until he has killed every enemy on screen. The screen becomes a little combat arena, so at first glance, the stepping technique seems to have been defeated, but it isn't. And the reason for that is even if the stage is divided up into little combat arenas, much like Bayonetta actually, that still does not prevent the player from breaking up the enemy spawns into smaller groups, since it must be the player that chooses to advance in the first place. And why this matters is if the player can isolate small groups of enemies and kill them without overlapping with each other, this vastly reduces the dynamics of the combat and prevents snowballing. It creates static paint-by-numbers level design. The intensity and the control intensity, like the, the game just decides what happens like at first at least it's like that because uh, you don't have control of the stages and stuff but even when you are a super player like the scrolling is always going to be like the same and uh, i guess this is something where uh, actually it's kind of like what you said about like gameplay density it's uh, it's exactly that like it's the kind of games where you can't like really wander off in the, in the darkness in the wilderness and just get lost and remember what we want from combat is for the player to have meaningful choices and one really strong way to create meaningful choices is to have enemy types snowball together. This forces the player to not only understand how to defeat enemies individually, but also how to defeat them when they are grouped up. This is important to enemy design because many enemies in isolation are not that threatening. But when you put them together in the right combination in groups, they can become nightmares. This is the magic of what makes shmup level design so compelling, and it would not be possible without auto-scrolling. Because individual variation in enemy eye can only go so far before it just feels random for the sake of randomness. But when you have groups of enemies, which form combinations of predictable behaviors, that group can create an ocean of different outcomes while not feeling random at all. A perfect example of this phenomenon is the Hall of Hell in Dodonpachi. In the Hall of Hell, you are attacked by waves of enemies that track your movement and try to pin you to the corner of the screen. 
the actual individual AI of the enemies is simple and direct. But what makes this section extremely replayable, even among world-class players, is how the enemy spawns cluster together. As a unit, every pixel of your ship's behavior is accounted for because every frame the entire group is updating and responding to what you do. And so even though it isn't random, this group behavior is deeply complicated and in a natural way. And so you have the tracking popcorn enemies and with perfect synergy, the section then adds in these large bunkers that attempt to block off the screen if you do not eliminate them. You put these two elements together and you have an iconic piece of combat design that is predictable and yet never exactly the same. Cave overall are masters of this style of level design and it is only possible because of the auto scroll. If your game's camera system prevents enemy spawns from blending together, that depth can never be introduced. And I know what some of you might be thinking, you might say, well, enemy overlap is still possible with the manual scroll if you just run forward and trip all the spawns. But the problem with this is that behavior goes against the nature of the relationship between the player and the game. The relationship between player and game is a competitive one. The player wants to beat the game, and the game wants to kill the player. So as you can see in my Metal Slug videos, if there is a camera exploit I can use for my advantage, I certainly will, and you should too. So by the nature of its design, an auto scroll turns the entire level into a combat arena with an automated timer. The fact that the background is moving by itself really doesn't matter. The background layer is mostly decorative. You could remove it and still have an auto scroll. What matters is that the enemies enter the screen based on time, rather than based on player position. And by having the enemy spawn based on time, the developer has much more freedom to ensure that there is challenging enemy overlap happening in a consistent, reliable manner. Understood in this way, you can identify sections and games that do not present themselves as an auto-scroller visually, but are in fact auto-scrollers in nature. Elevator sections in beat-em-ups are a fun example. These sections lock the player into a single screen of full movement and then spawn a bunch of enemies based on a timer. They are, by all definitions, an auto-scrolling section. Another unexpected case is the first-person shooter Devil Daggers. This game does not look like an auto-scroller visually, since it takes place in a circular combat arena, but if you look into the system of how the game works, you'll learn that all the enemy spawns are based on timers, not based on killing them in groups to advance, like Bloody Palace in Devil May Cry. What difference does this make? A lot, actually. Because in Devil Daggers, if the game was programmed in distinct waves, that would create a static game progression, especially in the early phases of the playthrough. This is the issue in Devil May Cry's Bloody Palace mode, where the first few floors are useless filler. Devil Daggers, the auto-scroller, is the smarter design, because the early enemies do not need to be eliminated in order to access the later enemies. The developer knows this, and this decision allows for a deep and interesting dynamic of spawner farming, where instead of killing the early enemies as you would naturally do, you leave them alive and you farm them for extra score with the trade-off of greater risk. This is what deep combat design looks like. It's a system of granular performance with sets of risk and reward that the player can either choose to engage in or not. You'll see this dynamic appearing in shmups all the time, like Gunvane's bomb mechanic, where if you accept the risk of keeping enemies alive on screen, then you gain a larger score by blowing them up all together. This creates legitimate opportunities of player choice. And what I mean by legitimate is that if the choice is always good with no trade-offs, then that really isn't a choice at all, is it? Like the weapon weakness in Mega Man X or the stepping exploit of Metal Slug. Two ways to play it. The speedrun style where you just run and route it out, and then the uh, tanky uh, slow walk style where you kill them, and I do both. <laughs> Earlier I mentioned there is a fourth dimension that is unique to shmup gameplay. That fourth dimension created by the auto scroll is time. 
One of the biggest misunderstandings when it comes to learning the genre is the idea that the primary skill in shmups is godlike reflexes. Comment section after comment section outside observers will marvel at how is it possible for players to dodge so many dense bullet patterns. The only explanation can be pure reflex. Luckily for us, that is not true. What advice would you give to players who, when they look at shmups, they think it's all about just reacting to the bullets, you know, how do you have such godlike reaction times, how do you dodge yeah. rain? So that's extremely wrong, <laughs> yeah, almost every experienced uh, player knows that, <laughs> like uh, even the game with the, f the, the faster the bullet gets in a game, the less uh, you need reaction time, basically, like psycho games, you almost don't need reaction time, it's very different, basically there are a lot of different skills, like, there is execution, you have uh, some uh, routing and stuff, memory, memory is a big part, like, I do think, like, like uh, one of my biggest quality in shmups is uh, having a very, very good memory. Of course, reflexes are a valuable skill in the genre, and you will be tested on them from time to time, but it is far from the primary factor of shmup talent. I can see how this misunderstanding develops, though especially if you are used to playing manually scrolling games, because in a manual scroll, you always see what's ahead of you before it's a threat. In an auto-scroller, however, you have perfect pace. You are always hitting the perfect line. And since you have perfect pace, you are able to reliably respond to actions that have not happened yet. In a shmup, you can see into the future. This is the secret. This is how jamers can obliterate a game as demanding as Dodonpachi. He can see patterns in his mind before they appear on screen. Really think about this. If you can anticipate the exact shape and placement of a pattern 10 seconds before it appears, reflexes no longer matter at all. You can take your time. This is why, in my opinion, the primary skill of shmups is not mechanical reflexes. It is precise spatial visualization. I think like the first few runs I do of like a new game, like I don't even press like the bomb button at all. Because <laughs> I just want to see like the patterns, to see how the patterns look like and how they work, and see if there's like a good way to dodge them. And like try to like visualize how these work and then build up, build that up to see uh, what would be the best route eventually. And like what is like really hard, what is easy. Like where do I plant my bombs and where do I, where can I skip bombs? And that's like, just build it up like stage by stage and pattern by pattern until you eventually get like a satisfying route you are uh, comfortable with to clear the game with. When you start to understand how your position influences the behavior of not only the enemies on screen, but also the enemies that are going to appear on screen, then you will find just how powerful the fourth dimension of shmup gameplay, time, truly is. So yeah, for the speedrunners out there, in a poorly done bare-bones auto-scroller like Mario levels, the screen scroll will feel like a prison, but in a game with complex enemy interaction and deep combat, the auto-scroll becomes a liberating force that frees you from the dilemma of playing lame and gives you the power to kill enemies before they even appear on screen. What are you doing? That's cool though, man. Working on a high score. Ready? Yeah. Go. Going back to the arcade business model, single player games in this context are in a bit of a dilemma. As mentioned before, arcade games need to be dense, deep, and replayable. So far in this documentary, I've explained how shmups accomplish the first two of these requirements, but there is the lingering question of replayability. In a multiplayer genre like fighting games, replayability is easy. Human opponents and social dynamics provide endless match motivation. So long as you can convince other people to play with you, this is the double-edged sword of multiplayer, where the value of the game is outside the code itself. If a fighting game does not have an active player base to compete with, even casually, the replay value of the game suffers. This is why, for most fighting games, they launch at full price and maintain their value during their competitive lifespan, but afterward, when few people play them, their value drops to bargain bin levels. Even for rich, well-made fighting games with single-player content like Virtua Fighter 4, this fate cannot be escaped. 
With single player games though, just playing for survival will eventually come to an end. Fortunately for most arcade games, the majority of people putting quarters in the machine will never come close to a one credit clear. So the survival lifespan for most arcade games like beat em ups is still pretty strong. Even years later, when the games are ported to consoles, players will still find value just trying to beat them without dying. However, what makes shmups unique is that they are not developed for a mass audience. If they were, they would have to tone down the difficulty and all the crucial elements that make them compelling in the first place. Instead, shmups are developed for a targeted demographic of hardcore players, which means that when a new shmup is released, it needs to contend with the powerhouse of legacy skill. Legacy skill is prevalent in shmups because they are fundamental. The core principles of their combat transfers from game to game, even across developers. This means that legacy skill is vital to address in order to preserve replayability. In fact, what makes shmups one of the most developed genres is that they have been in a constant arms race against their players since the 1980s. This is another reason why shmups are so famously difficult. I think over time I went, I looked at more and more videos and like references to see like how you can best like tackle things. I think that came like over time. I think that's also like a skill, a quiet skill I think, to like find information mm -hmm. and like bring it all together and like mold it to like your own route and play style. I think that's uh, not a subset, not a skill subset I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think if, if you're with more experience, like if you get more experience at the, like at the genre and stuff, and if you play a lot of games, you tend to pick up like quicker what's happening in these videos. Mm -hmm. You pick up quicker like what is this player trying to do? Like what is he actually trying to accomplish by these movements and like this, this dodging and this shooting? I think you can pick it up a like, lot faster that way if you have more experience like playing all these games. When Dodonpachi was released, the developers expected super players to take at least six months to get the very first two all clear of the game. To their shock, it only took one month. They also anticipated that the game's scoring system would max out around 400 million. They even used invulnerability cheats to figure out this number. And sure enough, the shmup god ZBL Nai managed to get 600 million shortly after release, blowing the developers' minds. So if survival gameplay was the only option for replayability, as it often is with console games, then arcade shmups would have a shelf life of a few weeks or even days maybe among the super player demographic, which would be a disaster. Survival is an important foundation of course, but in the end, there needs to be another system that pushes the performance of players even further. That system, if you haven't guessed already, is scoring. Scoring is a complicated beast and there's no doubt that STG have pushed the concept furthest in the gaming landscape and what scoring can offer is multi-dimensional, beginning with peer-to-peer -peer competition. There are different reasons why people play video games and I won't dig into that iceberg too much, but my primary motivation is their competitive nature, even if I am just playing against the computer. Multiplayer, of course, is directly competitive, but I think single player games tend to be underrated in terms of what they can offer competitively. With single player games, competition can take two forms, internal and external rule sets. An example of an external rule set is speedrunning, where a group of players create a competitive metric of speed and then judge gameplay performance by that metric. And what's cool about external meta, and speedrunners will often discuss this, is how by imposing a new framework on an existing game, it is possible for that meta to shift the context of the game's mechanics in interesting ways. Instead of being judged by intended metrics, the elements of the game are now evaluated by how fast they are. This creates unique incentives that the developers never anticipated, like constantly looking down at the ground in GoldenEye. During natural gameplay, Rare never intended to force the player to constantly stare at the ground as he moves around the level, clearly. So for better or worse, the use of time creates granular replayability and a reliable performance metric that did not exist before. The issue with external meta, however, that speedrunners don't often discuss, is its arbitrary nature. 
Who has the ultimate authority to decide on these rule sets and why? That's unclear. And where does this authority come from? Sure, you can cite something like a community of players who all democratically decide what the rules are, but what influences this decision making in the first place? Is it completely unbiased? And even if the community is faithful to majority rule, this means that players with dissenting views will not be able to play with viable competition. And I know speedrunners will say, well, just make your own rule set and hope it catches on, which sounds nice. But rule sets are not created in a vacuum. The popularity of the mainstream rule set will have a gravitational effect that suffocates smaller, less popular alternatives. So more often than not, if there is a divide in how a game is played, the most popular rule set persists and the less popular ones wither and die. The only speed games that are able to maintain multiple rule sets are the extremely popular ones, since they have a large player base to begin with. Another issue with speedrunning is that its meta can cut both ways in terms of game mechanics. In a platformer, where moving across the screen quickly is natural to the game mechanics, speedrunning works extremely well. This is why platformers are a very popular speedrunning genre. In a combat-focused game, however, like shoot-em-ups or action games generally, speedrunning is not a great fit because avoiding fights is faster than engaging in them. Why waste time attacking the enemy when you can run away? And then even if your game locks away player progression to killing enemies, the meta tends to devolve into spamming the fastest damage per second options like grenades or special attacks. So in the end, speedrunning, while a cool way to add replayability to dead-end games, is not a one-size-fits-all solution, as it tends to be advertised. After all, if your combat design is well-made with auto-scrolling elements, auto-scrolling negates the concept of speedrunning completely. You can't speedrun a game that already has perfect pace. That should do it, that should do it. Bomb. Yes, yes, yes! This brings us to the second model of single-player competitive play, internal scoring, where the performance metric is built into the game itself as an internal system. Arcade games, of course, are the famous birthplace of this concept. And what I find particularly attractive about scoring systems is that they are less arbitrary than fan-made meta. You don't have questions like, is auto-fire cheating, or what is a major glitch? If the game gives you more numbers, you are scoring correctly. In a scoring system, it is the game itself that computes the player's performance. What is fantastic about this internal consistency is that not only does it keep the game more in line with its primary mechanics when done correctly, but it also creates a uniform competitive environment over time. Yeah, the, the tournament, we, like, we assemble like a team of like, Toho players <laughs> and we uh, joined as the Toho team <laughs> in the shops form, SCGT, and then things called uh, Toho is harder, the team was called. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up like like crushing like the entire tournament and it was, it was like very funny because people like that, people there had like a bit of a low opinion on like Toho. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was very funny to just like smash them all, smash all the scores and like take over the form. <laughs> In a fighting game, you can only ever compete with other players in real time. So if you are the best third strike player in the year 2024, it is literally impossible for you to play against the best third strike player in the year 2004, as he was at that time. That player was Daigo, by the way. And no, playing current day Daigo doesn't count. I'm talking about playing a player during his prime. In a scoring game though, this is possible. In my favorite game, Dodonpachi, I happen to own a tape from an incredible super player that was recorded in the late 90s. If I was so inclined, and maybe I will someday, I could play Dodonpachi and try to defeat this player's score from decades earlier. So unlike a fighting game, even if you are completely isolated and have no other players in your area, it is still possible for you to compete with other players not only through geographic distance, but also through time itself, which is compelling wherever you are. After all, if you are the current world record holder in a shmup like Ketsui, 
you could still continue to play the game and push your scores, not only to defeat your contemporaries, but also to try to challenge future players as well. So shmup scores are timeless. They can extend both towards the past and into the future. And this is just the competitive benefits of scoring. Now let's discuss the internal benefits of a scoring system. Remember earlier in this documentary when I mentioned the issue with the shot type weapons in Mega Man X and how the use of these weapons without counter incentive negates the whole combat of the boss fights? In speedrunning, this issue still persists since speed killing the enemies is the goal. The shot weakness issue is not resolved by speedrunning unless you follow an arbitrary rule set like Buster Only, which sadly is not that popular of a speedrunning rule. With the introduction of a scoring system, however, Mega Man X would be able to have its cake and eat it too. If the game decided it would still allow players to use shot type weaknesses, but then punish that action through a scoring penalty, this could create a meaningful trade-off where the player has to access easier survival at the cost of their score. Of course, the player can simply ignore the score as most players do, but this trade-off is still meaningful because the game is formally evaluating the action in a way that competitive players can use objectively. So for scoring to matter, you do need to opt into caring about competitive play, but once you do opt in, you now have an entire new game waiting for you that is consistent for everyone. Another overlooked feature that scoring offers is its ability to recontextualize otherwise broken strategies back into the overall meta of the game. Rank in Battle Garega functions in this manner, where if the game did not have a scoring based extend system, the rank would force the player to play as passively as possible to keep the rank under control. I have seen runs like this and it is an interesting design choice, but ultimately unsatisfying. With the balancing factor of the scoring extends though, the player has a meaningful reason to play aggressively. Aggressive play will create more score, which will earn more extends. Then with the extra extends, the player can suicide these extra extends and reduce the additional rank. It's a bold and brilliant example of intertwining the survival based gameplay with the scoring metagame. 2D like rising, like you see like by regret games like that. Yes, I, I love how crazy uh, these games are, like uh, lots of impossible patterns, but lots of ways to exploit them by rank, uh, by weird strats, and I uh, kind of like uh, uh, shmups that, uh, that want you to go against the principles of the channel. Like for example, not shoot, uh, for example, uh, suicide, uh, for example, I, I always think it's fun, and when you think about suiciding, there's quite many games where it can be useful, like uh, psycho games, even some, some cave games, or even Gradius games and Parisium for like lowering rank. Like, there's many times you have a good reason for not uh, doing exactly what the dev wants. And it's always funny to, to try to, to, come up, uh, to come up with, and yeah, Rising is, is really big brain, so and it's also really fun to execute, so yeah, that's, fun. that's one of the reasons. One critique of this system you could make, though, is that it damages the survival-only aspects of the game, which is true. This is why Garega is not an entry-level shmup. It is designed directly for players who already understand the dynamics of scoring, and if you don't understand these dynamics, you will feel Garega's wrath, which is a very shmup thing to do, by the way, sacrificing accessibility for depth. That being said, how the scoring and survival gameplay are balanced off each other is a complicated discussion that needs to be examined in the context of the individual game. But I think we can all agree, no matter what form of scoring we prefer, the actual existence of the scoring system is important. I was saying to Plasmo, like, a good scoring system is not a well-made scoring system, it's a scoring system that is hard to figure out. Like, basically, the harder your scoring system is to figure out, like it's really, like, basically, you, your game has an infinite life. Like, uh, if players can still play the game in 20 years and still haven't figured out the optimal routes, this is, right. a, good, this is a good scoring system. <laughs> What yeah. is the difference between having a hard to figure out scoring system for versus just a really complicated, obscure scoring system? Or are those the same? No, no, not really. Like usually, most of the time, obscure scoring systems are just uh, because uh, 
The game has a scoring system, which is not obvious at the first time on a, a very small player base. And uh, like 99% of the players in the Schmuck community don't care about score. Like people just want to shoot stuff and dodge bullet and uh, everyone was doing the same. I was doing the same at first and uh, I think this is a very, very fun way to play the game. It's just that uh, I got into scoring and I started playing for Schmuck for score and loved it. Like uh, I really like changing games for a reason. Very nice flow to the games. It is this extra layer of granular performance that allows shmups to be both immediate and replayable at the same time. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? At this point, I think everyone understands how crucial the arcade has been to the genre of shmups both in terms of their design as well as their monetary sustainability. And unless you've been living under a rock for the past 20 years, a sad reality is that the arcade business model is in massive decline. I know that some people are hopeful for a resurgence, but I don't think that will happen. Sure, there is a niche marketplace for throwback style arcades with people frequenting them to relive that experience of playing these games in person, which I think is cool and I am more than happy to visit these locations myself. But for the arcade business model as a whole, as in a source of money strong enough to support larger scale game development, premium games, because remember arcades are historically a premium market, not a hobbyist market, that is not going to happen. The fact that Namco, one of the last holdouts of the business model, developed Tekken 8 directly for console instead of arcade first is a fairly definitive death nail. From this point forward, anything coming to arcade only probably will be small scale indie tier, again, which is cool, but not nearly enough to keep business sustainable. Because let's not forget, as bold as shmup design is, it's not a genre that can hold up an entire marketplace, even when arcades were still relevant. As I understand, during the 80s, old school shmups had a ton of coin revenue, Space Invaders being famously popular, but during the modern bullet hell era, developers like Cave, despite clearly making top tier games, could not remain sustainable. Their final arcade shmup was released in April of 2012, 12 years ago. So where do shmups go? Do they die out completely? No, I don't think so. What I think is happening, and we are seeing it in real time, is that the genre is having a second birth in the indie game market. Indie STG is not a new trend, remember Euro shmups, but what I think is happening is the arcade style of shmup design is having a renaissance in the West. Western indie developers are starting to figure out how to make genuinely good arcade shmups. Shmup developers were in a pretty sticky situation back in the day because there was no proper arcade culture in a lot of places with no like 1ccs, no scoring competitions and all that stuff. The developers didn't really treat the genre seriously and they relied on their surface level understanding of, of it to, when, when recreating the games. As a result, when they made them, a lot of elements just completely uh, got lost in translation more or less. Oftentimes the games would be really impressive visually or like technically you would see the screenshots and you would be like whoa This looks amazing, but when you actually start playing them Then they would be these really slow plotting boring games where your firepower is low the enemies have bloated hell They come in really uninspired formations often directly and slowly floating downwards There's no like interesting dynamics with point blanking or anything like that the, the stage design would be uninspired. Often the scoring system would be either completely ex exploitable or just like just very bare bones and uninteresting in, in every way, pretty much. Be because their understanding of the genre was, oh, this is like a simple quarter stealing, like brain dead genre, what they would do is they would fill up those uh, holes, those perceived holes, uh, with RPG elements and like story and all these kinds of uh, genre hybrids, you know. Because the developers focused on fleshing out the visuals and all these kinds, kinds of like uh, secondary elements, you know, like RPG elements and story and stuff, the foundational layer of the games, which is you know, the move and shoot gameplay, stagnated. As far as I know, the developers didn't really communicate all that much and didn't uh, document their process or didn't even like research the games too much. 
In the mid to late 2000s, though, a lot more interesting stuff started to happen. Because people would discover uh, to uh, uh, doujin games through like Toho, through French Bread, and of course you had the beginning of the Shmups forum, which would kind of create a proper uh, groundwork, like bottom layer for uh, for developers to, to uh, build off of. Because now you had players that were actually interesting, interested in these games. They played them, they tried to once you see them, they tried to get decent scores, and they would uh, discuss what makes a good shmup, what makes a bad shmup. Is this a Euro shmup? Is this a, like a proper shmup? You know, they would create different distinctions, categories. They would categorize, they would discuss, they would break down a little bit. You know, it was pretty primitive back then, but they would still uh, approach it a lot more analytically, which I don't believe the early developers did. Or if they did, it didn't show, you know? Then in the 2010s, it all kind of came together. So you had uh, the forums, which uh, would become more active. They would start translating different articles, like super player interviews, the interviews with developers. Shmuplations also uh, started translating developer developer interviews. You had stuff like the Racket Boy uh, uh, intro to shmups, which got a lot of people into the genre. You had the 360 ports, which got a lot of people into like cave shmups and all that stuff. You had the uh, STG Weekly forum. You had the uh, uh, Steam bringing over a bunch of doujin games on their platform by the Steam Greenlight. And a lot of these things would kind of like go on to influence developers. And uh, you, you saw that almost very quickly, in fact, because you saw Arrow Chimera come out in, I believe, 2013, which was a proper arcade uh, shmup that could rival Japanese doujin games at that point. Which was crazy. It was like unknown at that point. Nothing even came close. Once that groundwork was there, where you had a community that uh, played these games for 1ccs, they would play them for score and uh, talk about different scoring systems, uh, try to break them down, the quality of the games jumped up immediately because the developers would read that stuff, they would communicate with players, they were often players themselves, they were just posting casually on the forums, and they would understand the genre more thoroughly in, in the same way that uh, Japanese doujin developers did, and even in the same way that arcade developers did back in the day. So you had games like Blue, Blue Revolver immediately, massive jump in quality, can immediately compete with the uh, Japanese doujin games. You had Zero Ranger, which was back then called Final Boss, again, immediately competes with uh, Japanese doujin games. And it's funny, if you go back and read some of the developer interviews, like for example on Shmuplations you can see the Churn Shot developer interview or the uh, Toplan interviews, they go through a bunch of uh, rules of thumb and like dis design uh, decisions they, they made and they explain their reasoning behind it. And you can actually go through them, make a list, go through them, and compare them to, uh, to early 2000s uh, Euro shmups, right? And you'll see, like, the Euro shmups follow none of them. Well, if you go to Zero Ranger and Blue Revolver and games that came out after, they follow, like, most of them. The gap between uh, Japanese-developed shmups and Western-developed shmups is shrinking over time. And uh, we know we're no longer playing catch-up as much, and we can actually start competing a little bit. You know, friendly competition. And um, I think it's only going to get better because a lot of the new gen... Like, uh, this new generation of developers already come into the genre respecting it to some extent. They kind of realize that they got to play for once they seize, that the games have a deep scoring systems they can learn, that, you know, it's a genre they shouldn't underestimate. As a result, they're more humble about studying these older games. And also, they have just have a lot more resources to work from. They can, like, read uh, guides, they can watch my guides, they can watch, like, lazy devs, they can join uh, Shmup Jams on the Chayo and get some practice. And there's, like, a community of developers helping each other out. So I think over time, uh, the Western developed Shmups are going to get better and better. And hopefully, we'll just destroy the Euro Shmup. And maybe replace it with uh, the Neo equivalent of uh, the Shmups, where, you know, you have those RPG elements, but uh, the fundamentals are really solid and nice, so that uh, an arcade Shmup player can start it up and really have a lot of fun. Something I like about Shmup Dev is how uh, passion-driven it is, because you're not going to get much money from it, you're not going to get much fame from it. Even the players, oftentimes, you'll make a really solid game, they'll be like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go back to Cave or Rising or Toplan, because they did it better 30 years ago. And sometimes you're like thinking, you're like, oh, they're right, they're correct. So you basically just got to make a game because you enjoy making uh, a shmup, because you enjoy playing them, because you enjoy making them, playtesting them, you know, all that stuff. I will say there is a bit of a sick, twisted pleasure not only to reverse engineering shmups, but also figuring out how you could possibly structure and present them to a more mainstream audience. Not because of the fame or money aspect, though that would be nice, of course, uh, but, but because uh, you just want them to feel what you feel. You want them to see what you see in the genre. 
and you're like, how do I, what kind of combination, uh, combination of elements will make them see? As good as the Japanese developers are at the fundamentals of the genre, I feel like they play it a little bit too safe and are very conservative when it comes to the game structure itself. And a lot of Western developers, a lot of like these Euroshmub developers, if only they learned the fundamentals, they could actually play around with the structure in a way that's a lot more radical than what the Japanese developers or the more hardcore, arcade-oriented Western developers do. In some sense, shmups are also immortal as a game developer genre, because uh, they're very simple to set up, especially in modern engines. A player could just decide to become a shmup developer and uh, get something up and running pretty quickly. In the same way that you just jump into the game and start playing, you also jump into the game development and start developing, and start designing the actual game, instead of setting up a lot of systems. As far as new developers go out, the, the main thing I would say is just start making, don't just plan things in your head, don't come up with the perfect uh, game design document, don't try to think through every aspect of development. As soon as you start developing the game, everything will crumble like a house of cards, like dominoes, every single plan you have will just uh, fall down. So what you need to do is you need to just like make something, come come in it with no preconceptions. Don't like think, oh, this is my dream game. This is going to be like the best thing ever. No, just come in like I'm going to make something. It's probably going to suck, but I'm going to make it anyway. And, and then just see how that develops. Let it grow organically and form your plans around that instead of uh, pre-planning everything. Because that's, it, it just won't survive. Like, the, it, it's like Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until, until they get punched in the face. That's exactly what development's like. It's like a nice punch in the face. Another thing I would say is just play the genre a lot. Just uh, get some on CCs, play for score. Just uh, play it, play, play, play. Learn the fundamentals. Understand what kind of problems the developers are solving and how they solve them. Like, there's no point of you trying to reinvent the wheel and solve problems that were solved 30 years ago. When you can be focusing on innovating or building up something, you know? Why waste time on... Uh, just problems that have been solved ages ago. Because development is such an intuitive process, the only way you can build those intuitions is by playing. So when you're playtesting, you can be like, oh, this feels wrong, what is wrong with this? And then you can actually start thinking and investigating. But until then, you need to uh, create a library of experiences to draw from, to, to uh, fuel in your intuition. And lastly, talk to people and get feedback. Shmup fans are very good at giving useful feedback and nailing down what's good about the genre. Lots of developers are willing to help too, since we're all kind of discovering all this stuff together and reverse engineering it, you know. There's shmup fans that are like walking encyclopedias. They will tell you like the most amazing doujin shmup that three people know about, and they will just casually drop it. So, you know, you really want to poke these guys around and try to squeeze some information out of them. So making games is pretty inadvisable. Speaking as a programmer, you pretty much make less than a rank-and-file JavaScript monkey would. It's a lot more work, and the closest thing to support that a bedroom indie can truly hope for is the absolute inalienable privilege of letting some middleman company profit off your wisdom and labour. There are more and more games every moment, and most, through various methods, both wholesome and less wholesome, have engineered ways to entertain the player for a very long time. Most popular games are generally very well executed. There's a large emphasis on quality and polish, meaning that even a truly excellent concept has a fairly large barrier to viability. However, people make games anyway. This is good. Trying to make other people's lives better is a fundamentally good use of time and labour. Even a game with 10 total players made a few people's lives better. Unless it was really bad, I suppose. Um, so... Shmups are at a few additional disadvantages. Their emphasis on linear, strictly time stage design is more or less in direct conflict with incremental upgrades and procedural generation, which is, as sports fans will know, the backbone of modern run-based games and their progression systems. They are technically dense, with short, intense play sessions, making them pretty poor games for streamers and let's players. The aesthetics of the genre have been co-opted into the mainstream, but the foundations are still poorly understood. Most gamers know what bullet hell is at this point, by some means or another. How many have actually played Dodonpachi? However, people make shmups anyway. Again, this is good. 
The good thing about being human is being able to understand logic, but not having to respect it. To build it, but not have to live in its walls. Personally, I chose to make shooting games because it was what I knew. I knew the genre well, I had played a lot of shmups. If I knew MMOs, I'd probably have tried to make something like that. Though, I will admit, with mixed results, most likely. Games are so new and complex that you really have to make your own decisions from scratch a lot of the time, even when you're working in supposedly very well-trod ground, like shmups. Sometimes it really feels like you're the only person in the whole world who could solve a particular problem. And when that happens, because it will happen, what you need is a deep knowledge of the territory. What is the problem here? How did other games solve it, and what were the side effects of that? I've been describing various disadvantages here in a fairly dour manner, but truly having no knowledge to turn to in a situation like that would be a pretty insurmountable disadvantage. So why not make it a secret weapon? You too can turn your esoteric wisdom of 90s games known by perhaps a handful of anoraks. You can turn that into a strength because even if you went trend seeking with your open world, auto battling, deck building battle royale with characters who say things like turning up the awesome. At the end of the day, making any type of game requires you to cling to every advantage you can. Personally, I hope to show off some really great stuff this year. If, like me, shmups are what you know, and you'd like to try your hand at it, because, uh, I mean, after all, at the end of the day, the coding, the coding isn't too hard, and the asset requirements aren't really insane, then I hope to see what you can do. Notable standouts would be Blue Revolver released in 2016, and then Zero Ranger released in 2018, and now Gunvane released in 2022. Those people are also like getting like really good at like uh, making shmups, especially like like Gunvane came out recently, mm -hmm. and that's a uh, and Bokok definitely knows how to uh, how to make one, so <laughs> it's very cool, yeah. And then on top of that, be sure to keep an eye out for what's coming out of Japan, especially from the M2 Shot Triggers team and the immaculate work they do on shoot 'em up ports. There's also a parallel phenomenon of other genres taking interest in the shmup aesthetic and then incorporating that into their Western console design. This issue was made clear to me during the supposed shmup Steam sale, where the majority of games getting top billing on Steam were not shmups at all. And the reason why this matters is because the bullet hell aesthetic is one of the strongest hooks the genre has for grabbing new players' attention, and if that hook ends up getting used and associated with mediocre roguelike games, then shmups will pay that cost as well. You can see this occurring with Toho to some degree, where the series' aesthetic was once very particular to the shoot 'em up genre, and those interested in the music and graphics of Toho needed to play the shmup games. For some reason, I felt like I, like I knew about the, the Toho games and uh, that they are like uh, really difficult and fun. And uh, I, I have no idea where I found out about those games. It, it was a lot before that, but uh, for some reason at that time, I felt like uh, maybe I want to try this. And uh, it was really fun. And after that, I guess I've been playing shooting games almost like constantly until today. At first, I only played Toho because I, I, I was aware of arcade shmups, but I thought they were too much about the shooting and not enough about the dodging, so I didn't try them at first. But once I, once I started playing higher difficulties in Toho, I, I had to get used to the dodging, I had to get comfortable with it. So I eventually uh, may, got the, had the willpower to, uh, to, to try a new thing and go to arcade shmups. Okay, it was like back in 2009, and um, I was looking at like YouTube stuff to see if there were like, any cool games, like hard, cool, interesting games. And I stumbled upon this like let's play of uh, a guy doing a door game, one of the door games, and uh, I think Perfect Jam Blossom it was. And he was like doing like a let's play of it, and it, it looked very interesting to me, very fun to play. So I tried it out, and uh, 
it was fun and eventually I found like, like this forum of other people who were also like playing it. I think it was called um, like Shrine Maiden, like Maidens of the Kaleidoscope. It was like one of those very old like forums, the whole forums. We were all like doing silly challenges and stuff and like making videos and it was, very, it was a fun time. <laughs> I was listening to um music for a very long time without actually knowing what it was. Oh, the Toho music. <laughs> yeah. Toho soundtracks. Yeah, exactly. Like for a long, very long time I was just uh, going through the tracks, never actually knew, knew what it was. And uh, one day I decided to take a look and I saw that it was games. So, uh, looked pretty fun, tried it out and uh, loved it. But now because of all the non-shmup spin-offs of the series, there are now fleets of fanatical Toho fans who have never played a shmup and never will. So this is something I think shmup developers should be aware of and hopefully in the long run, the genre can continue to branch out with additional styles that also become popular because I do think that would be healthy for the genre in the long run. But speaking realistically, I don't think shmups have an easy road ahead. I think the genre will continue to face financial hardship and limited popularity. But even with that struggle, I do believe they will continue to endure. Shmups offer a beauty of game design that cannot be found anywhere else. Their approach to combat is pure and challenges the player at his core. And even though the genre is vicious and demanding towards newcomers and many people will not appreciate that level of intensity, I do believe that for the players who do connect with the genre, that connection is going to be powerful because even though it doesn't make logical sense why it's worth spending so much time struggling with these obscure games, it could be said that love is not logical, that love is absurd, that love is passion against reason. Keep improving, keep enjoying, and have that kind of spirit that I say I have when I'm playing Mushihime Sama. That is, it's like a, a pleasure playing those games. And if you don't want to play a certain way, don't do it. First of all, because you're not actually gonna play well if you're not having fun. And second of all, because playing, uh, because having fun is the entire point. It, it takes like a, a village to like want to see a shmup. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's fun to like like come together and like discuss strategies and like figure out all of this all these things about how to uh, tackle a game and how to beat it i think that's just a fun aspect of it so don't don't think too hard about it and just have fun and uh, have fun with the people and eventually you'll, you'll get a, a clear and it will feel great and it will feel good and it will be awesome play the games see if you like them and if you like them uh at least try some different kind of shmup. So it's really hard for me. Like basically, the first thing I tried, like uh, Toho games, I played Toho and I loved it. But I guess that maybe someone we won't like uh, Toho games, and maybe they, are, they would like Raiden games better or other stuff, or maybe Cave games. I, I couldn't say. <laughs> or maybe Gradius or anything. Get lucky, get something you like, and uh, keep playing it. Like for me, it was just about fun. I found a game I really liked. And I uh, just kept playing it and I uh, wanted to get better. I saw something, someone who was much better than me wanted to get good and uh, keep playing them because it was fun. But yeah, just play because it's fun and nothing else really. If it's not fun, don't play. For me, very basic, uh, very basic thing, but just pick a game you like and uh, like don't force yourself. Like if this is not the genre you like the most, like it's okay, you can even enjoy it casually, like credit thing. Or, um, things like that. If you want, seek to be to be good, get better. Like watch some guys, and I actually like a lot of your videos you did with like uh, explaining boss patterns and things like that. Like, yeah, you have lots of resources for that, but like don't necessarily feel it's a need. Like for example, I got into the channel without looking at much guide, just playing. And if you do it like that, and if you're serious, you're going to get better. But yeah, basically just have a good time and play games you like. Like don't uh, necessarily take uh, advices too seriously, but uh, consider them if you're having a, a problem uh, learning a game or just getting into a new style of proper or anything else. 
Starting off, I'd say um, play the games that you think look fun and set your own goals. Don't worry about what other people's goals or can like, or compare yourself to what other people do and just, just play for the fun of it and if you're not having fun, stop. So. I have got to uh, 1.5 especially. It was the first game I actually picked up and wanted to learn the score in it. And I think it's actually a really good game for that because uh, it has like these uh, ways to make the game easier the hyper system it works differently than in Diode, so like uh, you can uh, use the hypers, but uh, they at some points they make your score less, but uh, they make it easier to hold the combo, so you can like incrementally build your plan until eventually you're at the point where you don't need to use any extra hypers. Try to meet up in person. I mean, that's for me, that's the whole point behind this. Um, Having a passion in common, like everybody's flying out to this place to play the same games, the same genre, and uh, for me the greatest part is being able to talk to you, meet you, being able to talk to other players that I know online. Um, like putting a face behind a nickname, that you know, for me is that that's the biggest thing. It is. I don't, I don't know. I care the most about that because the next time we talk to each other, we we'll remember oh, that was a nice guy. I mean, I really want to keep in touch with him. Don't be afraid to try plenty of other games. Like plenty of games. Like just, just be curious. Like play games, even if you don't like them that much. Like just try maybe a few credits. See if you like them. If you don't like them, like why do you not like them? And maybe the, like try to find yourself as a player what you enjoy uh, about shmups in general. Uh, and. It's the games, but also like ways to play them. Maybe some players are like, oh yeah, I'm doing two CCs, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Some others are like, no, I'm gonna go hardcore in the scoring. You have to know what, what you are like and what you want to go, where you want to go like as a player. I think the most important thing is that you get better with yourself. Better player, better touching, better, better memory. You, it's always with you. The battle is, is with you. When, then you can compete for scoring, but it's another topic. You know?